ten forty eight. Looks like we're all back in session. Yep. Ten forty eight and the next presenter will be Canon Associates. Hi, my name is Eliza Harris Giuliano. Thank you for having us, Mayor and Council. Uh, we're excited to be here to talk about the Punta Gorda Master Plan. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our team, uh, our approach to the project, both in terms of management as well as substance, and what we as a team bring to Punta Gorda that's unique. Um, Canon Associates has been operating for nearly 40 years internationally in 14 different countries, but we worked with lots of local governments throughout the state of Florida to build powerful visions that are also realistic. We're led by Brian Kanan, who's been leading that firm throughout the, that 38 years. Uh, he would have loved to be here today, but he's actually participating in a ULI council. That's a national leadership group of urban designers and developers um, that really sets the, uh, to talk about best practices and keep us on the leading en edge of innovation nationally. But he will be involved in the Shred and in other elements. I um, will be managing the project. I've been working closely with Brian for over a decade on these types of projects as well as private and regional planning projects. Um, I, I'm sort of the geek in the family. Brian's more the visionary and the design guy. Um, I keep the trains running on time, I lead our GIS and our analysis, and I get into deep into the weeds on the regulations in partnership with groups like our engineering uh, subconsultant, of course. And I also am involved at the state and national level on smart growth issues. We have a three studio organization, so Greg Witherspoon leads our landscape studio, and one of the unique things that brings to our planning practice is that they see those projects through to construction. So we have a really firm idea of what our projects look like um, when they go into the implementation phase. Similarly, Tony leads our architecture studio and starting with creative ideas and taking them all the way through to construction documents for everything from really high-end custom homes down to affordable housing, which is a passion of Brian's. Another unique member of our team is Jurgen Duncan. He has uh, a super interesting background, having grown up in a military family in Germany and seeing a lot of different transportation options that are beyond what we're used to seeing in the United States, but then came back to the US and worked for several decades in US engineering firms. So he has a unique combination of understanding urban design and aesthetics with understanding the nuts and bolts of transportation function for both biking, walking, and driving. And then Henry Tamura, um, another unique asset in our firm is uh, creates beautiful illustrations and he's moved seamlessly from creating all of the hand-drawn illustrations into the digital world and doing photorealistic type renderings. So we think we've assembled a great team here. Um, of course, Jaime Correa, you may be familiar with, he was the team leader of the 2005 Citizen Master Plan. Also with us is Stan Geber. He is from Fishkind Associates, which is really the go-to firm for economic analysis in the state of Florida. And then Ken Galander, who I've had the pr uh, pleasure of working with in the past, who's with RWA Engineering, uh, which has offices throughout Southwest Florida. So I'm gonna use this graphic to lead you through the project. Um, we put together a pretty conservative schedule, um, and we built in a, a good amount of time for staff review of deliverables, as well as coming back to council at different stages with, um, with check-ins throughout the project. We also know that um, we're f we need to be flexible. I think when we went into the project in, uh, in Dustin that we worked on with Ken, we had a beautiful schedule and then we found out everything had to be done before the next election. And by the way, everyone was leaving in about two months for season. So everything had to happen much quicker than we anticipated. So we're very flexible on this and we, um, we, we flex the realities of the situation. Uh, you asked us what we did to change the scope, so I just want to highlight a couple of um, small but, but important changes. We added a presentation back to council at the end of the first phase because we know you're really interested in this economic piece, and so we wanted to make sure to get that back to you as soon as we could. Um, we also think it's pretty important to have a council approval of the vision before we get too deep into the implementation phase. So we added that step at the end of the master plan uh, charrette phase, and that's exactly what we did recently in the city of Titusville where we have an approved vision that we then 
moved forward into, in that case, uh, an amendment of their um, comprehensive plan. And as part of that, the actual implementation plan moves into phase C. Now, we're certainly thinking about implementation throughout, but that plan is in the last phase. We also tweak the name of, the, of phase A to include the fact that it's also dealing with physical context in the review of the previous plan. So in our experience, the project award phase usually takes about two months from selection to uh, actually having a contract. We like to develop the details of the contract, including the timeline for the reasons I just said, as well as uh, detailed, detail around the deliverables in collaboration with staff and decision makers because we understand that your situation is going to be unique and so we don't wanna try to force a process we use somewhere else onto your situation. Moving into the first phase, one of the big things we focus on, of course, um, from a design lens is the physical character of the place as people experience it on the ground. And then we also, of course, have the ability to go up to 30,000 feet and see the big picture using our GIS and mapping analysis. One of the things that uh, you asked for, but that we also do on a regular basis, is look at what the competitive landscape looks like, both in how we can exceed expectations relative to other projects in the region and sometimes in the state, and also if there are pieces that we want to emulate um, from other projects that citizens like to visit or, uh, or experience. And then the 2005 master plan review is also part of this step. Of course, we have a wonderful asset with Jaime Correa being on our team you can really understand the original intent of the plan. But at the same time, as Canaan Associates coming in fresh, we have a new perspective and we're not married to any of those recommendations. We wanna give them the proper weight given the extent of public involvement that went into those. But we also need to make sure we're hearing new voices moving forward in the process. I'm gonna hand it over to Stan Geber to talk specifically about the economic piece. Thanks, Liza. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Stan Geber with Fishkind and Associates. Thanks for having us here today. So Fishkind and Associates intends to uh, provide the economic and the market expertise that informs the planning elements and the engineering elements. So our uh, areas of expertise include land use demand, market demand, development potential, and absorption rates, and how all these kind of economic matters and factors affect fiscal conditions and economic conditions as we go forward in the development process and in the planning process. In addition to the market economics, our plan is to deliver to you a fully calibrated fiscal impact analysis model. This is a model, it's a tool, which it allows you to evaluate the costs and revenues on an average basis costs and revenues of particular land use choices or particular geographic area choices that you may want to examine to find out, you know, are these things fiscally sustainable? Do we have surplus revenues or negative revenues from a particular area or a land use type choice? And then we can evaluate those. We can make some tweaks and balance and, and, balance and change those things. Um, the goal is really to identify potential revenue sources, to provide you with a fiscally sustainable set of options and directions, which in particular keys off of the 2016 annexation summary report, where we've done a lot of work in terms of identifying areas, ranking them with a really good table matrix. Um, we wanna take that matrix in hand, sort of take it to the next level to, uh, use the, the top ranked areas to see if there are any changes to that in terms of planning, design, or ranking as we go through the public input process and the design process. And then potentially, if this is where you wanna go, is to hand you a, a roadmap for implementation. What are the key annexation areas that we wanna start with based on the matrix, based on the public input, adding to that fiscal impact analysis tool, which tells you, you know, how do we balance this financially? How do we identify the new revenue sources? And then add to that market-based reality with real-world market economics to drive demand and development potential and hand you a roadmap for next steps for how do we go to the next level? How do we grow? And this is the kind of thing that we're really excited to do because we get to do that not only 
uh, in a real world sense, but on a, a what if sense. So working with Kanan and working with the other partners in the team, and what we really like to do is to examine what happens when we apply different types of design standards, different types of urbanization alternatives, and test those fiscally to see what kind of revenue generation they could potentially make for you. So with that, I'll turn it back over and get to the next slide. Great. Thanks, Dan. So the heart of this project is, of course, the master plan charrette. This portion of the schedule includes not just the shred itself, but the lead up to it, as well as the documentation and approval. Um, but this is really core to how we involve the public in the, on a regular basis. Whether we call it a workshop or a charrette, we understand that we're working collaboratively with the public. We're going in informed, but at the same time without preconceived notions of what the solutions might be, and then coming up with really creative options. We start that process off with a pre charrette visit. This is an opportunity for us to work with stakeholders to, um, with key leaders that you identify in the community, perhaps yourselves and staff, to decide what we should focus the conversation in the charrette on as a starting point. And we've already started to throw out to you some of, some of those things we think you're gonna wanna focus on, such as we know um, redevelopment in particular height, downtown is a major issue, transportation is always a major issue within these land use plans, and that's really part of Canaan's specialty finding the intersection between urban design, transportation, and land use. Um, I, in particular, uh, have a specialty in biking and walking. I bike to work on a regular basis, and I'm on the board of Bike Walk Central Florida in my home area, as well as working on those issues nationally. And we're very aware of national trends and how those might affect the future possibilities within Punta Gorda, and making sure those factor into our planning. During the first, so we've, we've actually split the charrette into two weeks, which is a new model that we're working with. Um, that first week is focused on learning from the community, setting the big direction, and we'll begin to throw out solutions and ideas um, from our creative design team. We understand that there was a significant public engagement process the first time. These photos all represent that, um, and Jaime, you'll see in many of them. Um, and so we, want, we think it's important, especially to the extent that we're making any recommendations that are different from the last plan, that we've had a similar le level of public engagement behind that. And we've got different ways of getting uh, people's feedback for different communication styles and whether we're talking about values and principles versus geographically specific issues. And then when we come back, we'll have had the opportunity to do a little research on any ideas that came up that we may not have uh, been planning for as well as refining solutions. And so we can come back with a really concrete idea um, that we can communicate to the public about what the future might look like. And so we can focus in that second week on gaining consensus. This has been very successful for us in the past. This particular solution, not just the pretty picture, but the actual idea received a 90% positive approval rating from this community. And that's a really strong way to go into that council approval session. And you'll also know if there's any issues where consensus is lacking. Um, so that is that will lead us into the implementation stage. And in terms of implementation, you asked us to focus on um, the land development code, which is great, because that's an area of strength for us. Um, we, we're gonna be starting to assess the complexity of the code all the way back in the first phase when we just do a, an overview of um, what level of change could be needed, so we know going into the public meetings what kind of environment your code is producing now, and then coming out of the charrette with a real vision in place, we can do a deep dive and say what standards have to change to make the, the future look different than it would look under the current standards. And we were experienced at working this goal into the charrette. Um, we did this as part of our Dustin project where we produced both technical drawings and engaging visuals that help the public understand what changes to the code might result in if they like these particular types of of built environments. And we're actually working right now on one of the largest form-based codes and um, really land development codes in the country, if uh, certainly the state if not the country, in Orange County. It's a comprehensive overhaul. It hasn't been comprehensively looked at since 1956. And so we're getting into pretty much every issue you could possibly get into from very suburban and rural situations to much more urban situations. Jaime Correa also has um, significant code experience, and then we'll, we'll have our engineering team to ground truth any of these ideas. 
Um, so ultimately, you end up with standards that are a result of combining the community's vision with what we've, as professionals, learned about the local character all the way back in the first phase and our experience on previous project and national best practices to result in your new standards. So you're walking out of this process with a powerful vision that's been agreed upon by the community, um, a clear framework for success, a roadmap on how to get there. And because we've been involving staff, council, citizens, <coughs> and also we know that uh, from experience that the local placemaking economy will wanna be involved in this in terms of local consultants, we'll be bringing them all along through the process so that everybody understands the vision and has a clear idea of where we're going and how to get there. So in terms of management, you're always, I'm always the first person that you can call and I'll make sure you get the answer that you're looking for. Of course, we have open channels so that if you have a question about economics, you can talk directly to Stan so he can uh, describe it in all of its wonderful detail. Um, but ultimately, Kanan will be responsible for managing the subconsultants, making sure the trains run on time and managing the quality of the deliverables. So I'm gonna hand it over to Ken from RWA. Thank you, Eliza. Uh, good morning, Mayor City Council. Uh, again, I'm Ken Galander. I'm with RWA Engineering. As she mentioned, we have a headquarters down in Naples, but we have a major office uh, just down the road in Fort Myers and also just north of you in Venice. But we're a full service firm, land use planning, uh, civil engineering, surveying, mapping. But from this local knowledge perspective, I wanna kind of frame this portion by stating, you know, our team, you know, the partnership that we established really provides a strong synergy of, of these various perspectives and expertise that's gonna allow us to really navigate really through this master plan development effort. But drilling down as a local firm uh, in support of this, uh, we have developed uh, a local knowledge and a positive uh, relationship uh, with our involvement uh, working in the city over the years. And as a result, uh, have gained a solid familiarity with the comp plan 2040 your land development regulations and really all the extensive planning initiatives and documents that you've established since that 2005 uh, master plan, citizens master plan. But as a local firm, we, we realize that uh, this type of effort, you need that outside expertise. And as Eliza stated earlier, and in a prior life, I was community development director for the city of Destin. And right now, uh, my thoughts are really uh, up there. Um, they worked 18 years up there, so I apologize, but um, privilege of working with Canaan, and uh, really through that effort, they brought a lot of successes uh, through that visioning effort, mainly through their expertise of the outside, that fresh perspective that we as staff and others in the professional community down there just hadn't seen in a long time, and that was successfully recognized, as you can see in that 90% approval uh, was really important to us. Additionally, the engagement of the partners uh, from the local firms and the professionals uh, that they were insured, the city staff uh, at that level were really involved and was so key to the successes. But of course, uh, as Elijah mentioned, the implementation part of any sort of master plan, it will be those local firms, those local professionals that are instrumental in taking the projects and taking those initiatives and moving those through. And it's no different than a firm like RWA to be able to work as being part of that and moving that continuity through the process. But so to wrap up, uh, we have a strong engaged partnership uh, with the team, the various perspectives from the historical and the prior knowledge of Jaime and the local knowledge that our firm can provide. And then that obviously strong outside expertise and fresh perspective that uh, the overall Canaan team can provide. So thank you and I'll turn it back over to Eliza. Thanks, Ken. So you specifically uh, talked about how we translate theory into practice. And this is another area where we feel like we're really strong because Canaan views ourselves as a research-based firm. These are just a few examples of some of our transportation research. Not only do we do this background research that's original or based on national best standards, but we're implementing it daily in our projects. But since we have a professor on our team, I'm gonna hand it over to him to really delve into this. So, good morning. I must apologize for something I did 14 years ago. In the summer of 2014, I did something that some of my colleagues will find unreasonable, risky, and even crazy. What did I do? 
I took a phone call from Team Punta Gorda and in less than 30 minutes, in less than 30 seconds, I decided to lead one of the greatest grassroots design efforts in the history of the state of Florida. It only took me 30 seconds to understand that on the tragic night of August 13 of 2004, the visual identity of the city of Punta Gorda and the sense of security of its citizens had been totally shattered by Hurricane Charlie. I knew this feeling because I had lost my own house during the events of Hurricane Andrew in 1992. During that phone call, I recognized that Punta Gorda was a thriving community with historic buildings and neighborhoods, retail areas, civic institutions, places of recreation, and people living in isolated developments along regional highways and along one of the largest networks of canals with direct access to the ocean in the west coast of Florida. This, for me, was a real place with real people. I also understood that Hurricane Charlie could have erased some of the city's landmarks, but it was not going to erase the hometown feeling because that quality was embedded in each one of the minds of everyone that I knew willing to be part of this community of decision makers. Six months later, I arrived to the Sacred Heart Catholic Church mm -hmm. with a team of collaborators who were not interested in pre-cooked ideas. No, ladies and gentlemen, that is not what we wanted. What we wanted to know was what each and every one of your citizens thought was the most appropriate thing for the city of Punta Gorda. And the only way to do that was to, by means of what at that time we called aggressive crowd listening. We had total faith in the intelligence of the crowd, and as professionals, we attempted to translate their wishes into a practical shopping list of projects and initiatives for the future. Seven days later, we delivered what is known today as the Citizens Master Plan of 2005. And that plan came with an admonition in page three, which said, while there is more community process to come, the discussion must now shift from planning to implementation. And boy, did I underestimate the power and commitment of the citizens of Punta Gorda. I cannot hide my admiration for the members of this community because every time I visit, I feel overwhelmed by the amount of good development, by the innovative ways in which you've implemented portions of the Citizens Master Plan, by the resilience of this city and its citizens, and by the political involvement of some of you who, who were normal citizens when I came here and that are now sitting up there. And here we go. I have a second confession to make. These days, I spend most of my available time at the University of Miami, where I'm a professor of urban design. And as a professor, I spend most of my time thinking about how to turn theory into practice. So let's start by asking us that question. What is theory? Theoria was the word used by the Greeks, and it meant a mental scheme a way of seeing the world. Theory is in fact the mental capacity to gain perspective, to form judgments, and to form ideas about the world and about our place in that world. Theory is not a problem. The problem happens when we, as scholars, remain enslaved in the comfortable world of ivory towers, or when we simply don't engage our judgments and our ideas in the complexities of the real world. I have learned that if I observe something long enough, I can eventually gain a direct vision of its essential features. And as a consequence, we can produce cities and architecture in which beauty, economy, and functionality are intermingled to produce places where you can find everything you need for your daily living at walking distance, including food production. To turn theory into practice, we can offer what David Hume, the greatest, greatest Irish philosopher, called a remedy for the obstructions of beauty. He said, we must use theory because we have to avoid our lack of delicacy, our lack of practice, 
our lack of precedence, our prejudice against the will of the crowd, and our lack of a method to discern the parts and the whole. Ladies and gentlemen, that is what we want to offer. We're here to offer you delicacy and beauty. We're here to offer you a deep commitment to our practice, a professional experience that amounts to more than 85 years of collective work, a methodology which has yielded results in this city and in many other cities around the world. And most importantly, we want to offer you a clear and unique system to grow from what we know today to what we need in the future. That is what we offer and that is who we are. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a moment charged with a new and infinite possibilities. Please allow us to do this together one more time. Allow us to become the guiding force for your citizens, for your business owners, your public officials and stakeholders. And thank you for having us here one more time. Thank you so much, Jaime. Um, so uh, to, to start to wrap up, um, you're really giving us a challenge that's within our core expertise. What we do as a firm at Canaan Associates and our partners as well is create powerful visions that communities can move forward with into creating great sustainable places for people to spend their time. Um, we do that through really robust conversations with the public. We do that by engaging all of the different disciplines that we have both within our firm, which include not just planning, but architecture, transportation, landscape architecture, and by partnering with great professionals in, in um, fields like economics and engineering so that we're not boxed in by any particular professional perspective, but we're able to come up with really unique ideas and solutions that don't necessarily fit in a neat box. And we think we brought the right team together. We have the perspective of the 2005 plan as well as Jaime's ongoing creativity in the University of Miami. We have the really the most trusted firm for financial analysis by local governments in the state of Florida. We have uh, a great partnership with an existing local firm that we want to move forward. And you know, I think similar to what Jaime was trying to get across, um, we, we have really a team of of people who are leaders in our profession. Um, I can certainly speak for Jaime, myself, and Brian. We're all involved both at the local and the national level in not just learning the best practices, but setting the best practices. And even as we do that, we understand that on each and every project, there's unique possibilities that don't fit any model. And so we go in with every project as an opportunity for locally based innovation rather than just um, the application, in addition to the application of the best that's out there that we're aware of nationwide. Um, so we think we've put together a great team with both our national expertise locally grounded in the past and the future. And we hope that you'll let us put all that to work for you in putting together this vision for the future of Punta Gorda. Thank you. Thank you. I'll start with a couple of questions. Um, first, for Fishkind, um, our CRA is set to sunset in 2030. So, how do you see that affecting your economic analysis, and what would you do with that information? Well, we can always uh, re-enable the CRA if the county will allow it. Uh, there's Home Rule, which allows you to capture some of the ad valorem revenues from the city. Uh, that you can implement as a revenue source. And within certain areas of the CRA, it, you may be able to find public-private partnerships uh, and contributions from the development community in terms of ad valorem tax givebacks and things like that. So that's not uh, uncommon to see uh, CRAs sunsetting. Um, if we're lucky, we can work with the county and get them reenacted. If not, we can implement home rule to capture some of those revenues. Thank you. The other one was for RWA. I'd like to know what prior involvement have you had with the city of Punta Gorda? Yeah, um, I've been with the firm for just a few months, but speaking with my colleagues, uh, back in the uh, uh, 2010 era, we uh, did some coordination with staff on uh, the height uh, analysis uh, and also 
uh, partnered with them as a team on uh, uh, presenting in front of a, a planning association, redevelopment association, regarding uh, the density and the myths of such a thing. Um, and me, uh, in a previous firm, uh, I was able to, in the private sector, a lot of due diligence work uh, for some private sector clients uh, within your city uh, limits here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, one of the things that's very important here is um, citizen involvement. And as um, Jaime pointed out, it's good to see you, Jaime, um, that um, uh, we need a, a robust involvement. The problem I, uh, that we have on the, the timeline uh, is it's very uh, long. And so when I look at months, it, it perhaps puts the charrettes in the middle of summer, which is going to miss season. So we would need to, like you suggested, we're flexible, um, are, you know, move all that up. So are you able to move all that up so we can capture the people while they're here? So we really need to run the charrettes in more of a, you know, March-ish, April, at least, uh, time frame. Um, and then also, uh, I have another question to follow, so go ahead. Um, sure, yeah, we're absolutely, we've already identified some areas where we can compress that schedule. Certainly, uh, the normal lead up we would do for a charrette can be rolled into phase one. It really depends on how comfortable council is with moving forward, having not seen the results of phase, of the first phase. And as long as you're comfortable with that, we are absolutely comfortable with that. Well, we already know how much feedback we get from residents when we try to make decisions, just normal decisions. Um, and people, you know, like to say, why would you make a decision like that when we're away? And we'd like to say, well, you know, um, other communities don't make, stop making decisions when you're down here. But that, I think in this case, it's such a major thing that we need to make sure we um, pr provide that opportunity. The other one is you mentioned that um, your charrette process now has been broken down into um, two phases and that that's something new. So can you speak to what's the advantage I know you kind of talked about it, but why did you decide to do that and how it, has that really benefited the process? Sure. Um, and again, we are flexible. So if for some reason that doesn't work in the local context, we're perfectly happy to do it the old fashioned way and we're competent to do that as well. Um, what it does is it enables us to have a little more breathing room to um, really flesh out some of the solutions and check the feasibility of them before we ask the public to make a consensus decision around those. But at the same time, we've been very successful with the other approach too. So we're open to both options. I'm not saying change it, I just, you know. Yeah. Thank you. Elaine? Um, I, I would echo a lot of what Nancy just said. Um, and nice to see you, Jaime. Good to see you back here. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the timeline goes, I think it's extremely critical that we that we funnel as much as possible into the first half of 2019 because that's going to be the key time when everybody is going to be available to participate. We know, um, and Jaime can attest from 2005, how many people in this community will be actively involved in this process, so I think it's critical. Um, and I, I certainly would like to see that timetable moved up substantially. Um, I think that's going to be a, a really big component of, of how it's how successful the project will be. Um, we certainly would love to um, have the expertise of any of the firms that are that are applying, but certainly um, the the previous expertise from Jaime, knowing what what goes on in Punta Gorda, would be helpful too. Um, but but certainly, if if there is a way that you could condense that timeline. And as Nancy um, alluded to, maybe even combining that charrette process and maybe even having it back to back rather than break, you know, breaking it out in two totally separate sessions, I think that would be very helpful to moving things forward a little quicker. Sure, we can absolutely accelerate that. I think I, I said to Ken, I'm pretty sure we had the first public meeting for Destin before the ink was dry on the contract. So. Mm -hmm. um, that was probably a little faster than we would have liked to go. I think we, we probably had our, we were having this session in, in what would be 2019. So we're ahead of schedule. Good. Any other questions? Just, just one more. Um, as it comes to, uh, uh, speak to the uh, financial analysis part of it, um, do you uh, speak to the, you know, we have economic downturns. We went through a horrible one in, in 2008 and there were a lot of things that were are potentially on the table to be done here in Punta Gorda, which have never materialized because of that. So um, um, how do we address that? Because everything is cyclical. So how, how, what it, how do you address that in your recommendations? 
Yeah, well, um, you're absolutely correct. And many cities and all of the capital improvements and the capital maintenance that was required uh, during that downturn was put on hold in Florida throughout the state, through many cities. Um, many cities have not recovered from that. Uh, yours has. You have some sort of natural uh, amenities and you have some coastal advantage, which allows property values to grow. But there's a lot of internal I interior counties uh, that are facing terrible economic conditions that never recovered from that. And then, you know, they're not coming back. Mm -hmm. And they're facing more problems, like in DeSoto with the, you know, downturn in citrus and things like that. So, um, yeah, economic downturns are real. What we don't see in this cycle is a huge run up in pricing and real estate pricing. Uh, what we don't see is a substantial amount of overbuilding. And so, yeah, there'll be a downturn probably in the next two to four years. Um, interest rates are on the way up. There's a lot of global economic uncertainty. Those things are factored into absorption and demand outlook. Um, but we don't see the kind of irrational exuberance in the cycle that we saw in 2007. And so, yeah, we'll see a downturn, but we probably won't see a plummeting, uh, you know, on the order of 60% in residential prices, which is what we saw in 2007. Uh, we won't see 90% decline in residential building permits because there's still a lot of demand that's out there. So, yeah, there'll be a demand uh, downturn. It won't be as bad as 2007. And, and it's the kind of thing that that does affect uh, revenue forecasts and how we implement. So, um, you know, normally in the economics world, we don't uh, forecast the end of the world. If we had forecast the end of the world in 2007, we'd have been better off because <laughs> that would have been correct. But, you know, we kind of stay within a rational range. And I don't see um, the kind of... Uh, uh, overbuilding and, and and problems in the markets today that we saw in 2007. Thank you. But we, we will be taking that into account for sure. I think along that line too, it's interesting to note because many people have said that after Hurricane Charlie, there was a surplus of insurance funds that went to a lot of the development that you see now. So that was another little anomaly that the, the, the city went through. Um, one more question. I wanted to know um, how many projects has Jaime worked with Canon and what cities were those projects in? So Jaime, correct me if I'm wrong before, um, if you worked in the past with, uh, with Brian, we, we've been actually collaborating for I think nearly a decade through the university. So um, Jaime's students um, have been working in our firm and with our firm and then Jaime has been supervising that. So we've been working very closely with Jaime in that way. Um, and we're actually in the process right now of, am I allowed to talk about the book? Of, of putting together a book through the university um, based on a collaboration where Brian uh, and Jaime recently, I'm very jealous that I wasn't able to go to Mexico with you guys. Um, to research what town squares might look like in the future based on what they look like in the past in Mexico. Excellent, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, no. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Okay, we are still running slightly ahead. We are. So. Is the other firm here? Is the other firm here? I didn't see him yet. Thank you. Let's go ahead and take um, a 10 minute either way.